Bienvenue sur ma chaîne, welcome to my channel. Today is a highly, highly requested video from all my law student viewers. Hello! I'm so sorry this has taken me ages to do. I've had a lot of questions. I have to go through them as I go through this video. But, um... One person had sent me a a very uh, detailed email and I'm going to read it out to you because I promised her that I would do a video response. So we are going to read that email right now and then I'm going to be going through all of your questions that you've asked me on various law school videos that I've done. And I promised that I would get this all out and I promised I would answer all your questions. So everything will be in this video. If you guys are my viewers that are not interested in law, please click off. This will not interest you. It will bore you to tears. But for all you law students that have asked me these kind of questions, just keep watching and your question will be answered. Here we go. Dear Edil, I came across the YouTube video you made about failing the bar. Firstly, I want to appreciate your video and coming out to talk about your experience as very few people have the courage to talk about it. I found your email on one of the comments. I was studying the BBDC at BPP University. My results came out yesterday. I did not pass. I used up my three chances to reset opinion writing. Let me tell you, opinion writing is a bitch. One of the worst. And I'm very uh, sorry to hear that, that you did not pass. As you know, uh, as you saw in my video, neither did I. And um, there is still light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. I got 57% and I got a not competent overall. I feel so sad. I'm thinking about the money spent on the course and the time. I know. It's absolutely dreadful and people have very little understanding about how, how detrimental this is to a law student unless they're in your shoes. People do not fathom, they cannot even comprehend the shit that we go through uh, during the bar. It's arguably one of the most difficult courses in Europe. As a result of the the bar, I suffer from depression and anxiety. I'm so sorry, darling. From watching your video, I have two options, which is study the New York bar or study the LPC and then transfer to being a barrister here if I wanted to. So I'm studying the LPC as a master's with business management as my option B. I am so proud of you for doing that and for going through and keeping with law to stick to it. And the RPC is a great option. I'm going to be speaking about all these things after this. I have an LLB and a master's degree in corporate and commercial. Woo, la-di-da. That's something to be proud of, darling. Which university are you? Did you do the New York bar? What are the entry requirements and fees of the course? I have an LLB and a master's in corporate and commercial law from England. I just want to research and have an idea. I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so let's answer each question one by one. So, okay. You so she's doing the LBC, you're doing the LBC, and that that's amazing. Honestly, it's absolutely amazing. So I wanted to kind of touch base on people who are kind of in two minds. I'm going to say this in all honesty, and not because, oh, because I'm doing the LBC, I'm against the bar. It's nothing to do with that. But this is my personal experience and my first account on things. So when you're in law school, whether you are doing the LLB or the GDL, especially the LLB, I consider the LLB to be a true, true law student because you're in it for three years. There's a difference between lawyers who do the GDL and lawyers who did the LLB. I feel like people who did the LLB have more of a legal mind. I know it sounds a, li a little elitist and snobby. I don't mean it to sound like that, but I notice a difference between students who've done the three LLB and students who've done the GDL. I've done bloody both, so I've got four years of undergrad law behind me. Anyways, this is the problem. When you, when you are in law school, whether you want the LLB or the GDL, you got really brainwashed into the bar side. And I don't mean it in a terrible way because 
law is divided in the UK. A lot of people who are not in the UK don't know that, especially Americans who have no idea that we have two very different sides, different kinds of lawyers in the UK, and they each specialize in one yes. thing. One is just specialized for the courtroom and the other one is specialized for everything else. Everything to do with the client's case, everything to do with the client and the close relationship with the client, that's solicitor. Solicitors on a salary, barristers are self-employed. Solicitors work for a law firm or a company, barristers work for chambers, self-employed. Chambers like is an, an office that they share the overhead, but you have to find your own cases. And you know, you get cases as a barrister when you join the chambers, but when you join, you're not gonna be getting the best cases. You have to kind of get the ones that people don't want or whatever. You have to start from the bottom because being a barrister is self-employment and it's all litigation. Because okay. advocacy came very natural to me because I'm a, I'm a speaker, I'm a talker. Obviously I've got a YouTube channel, I can talk for ages. Advocacy was so easy for me and not to brag, <laughs> but during my LLB, I got to finals for the internal MOOC competition and I was highest individual score for my cross-examination competitions. So I'm not meaning, I'm not being like, oh, rah, rah. no, I'm just trying to tell you because I achieved that during my LLB, I was totally en route in my mind to be a barrister because advocacy was my forte in school. I was feared. I had people coming up to me telling me how scared they were when they're up against me the next day. Again, I'm not being a conceited bitch, whatever. Advocacy is a skill that many lawyers have. I don't feel special because I have a skill, but the point is because I excelled at it at university and I really freaking loved it, it was the bar or nothing for me. It was everything. And when I was finally on the bar, so many, I've ha I had a lot of personal issues. My father uh, was diagnosed with cancer, literally right before my exams. I lost my last pug brother who I grew up with. It was just a really fucked up year and I should not have been on the bar because when you're doing the BBTC in England, you really need 100% focus. You cannot have anything distracting you and you really, really have to put your all 100% into it. I'm surprised I passed the, the amount of exams I passed because I was not there. I was there, but I wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? I was physically there, but my mind was not there. I'm, And of course I did really well. I got VCs on almost all my advocacy exams because it comes natural to me to just speak, but written exams were a bitch. Civil uh, litigation, criminal litigation failed, opinion failed the first time. Like, opinion's hard. It, it's very difficult. Oh, you and should not feel bad if you fail opinion. So many people fail opinion. There's a case um, in England. I think the student was at City, the same school that I did my bar at and my GDL. He failed opinion. That was the only exam he failed and he sued the school because he didn't want, he didn't think it was just for him to go back and do all 14 exams when he passed 13 of them. But it's not up to the government, it's up to the BSB, the Bar Standards Board, and those are the rules. Even if you fail one exam, you have to do them all over again. So he didn't get what he wanted and he wasn't successful in the case. But my point is, what did he fail? He failed opinion. Opinion's a bitch and I'm going to say it again. So do not feel bad if you fail opinion. It is really difficult. And what makes it difficult is the time. Most barristers get like a month to do an opinion and you have to do yours within four hours. It's not easy. It's really not easy. And I think what caught me out every time was time. It's, it's, it's time. Um, and that's with a lot of the law exams. Sometimes you know the content, but if you're not quick enough, you're not fast enough, you can't write, le write legibly, you're screwed. So anyway, let's go to the first question. Which university are you? Okay, so right now I am doing my LPC in International Commercial Law at the University of Law. And I'm doing distance learning. And can you believe that I chose, I chose this specific university, of course it's very reputable, but I specifically chose it over BPP and City because they were the only ones at the time offering the LPC and Joint Masters from a distance learning. And I'm so lucky I chose that because 
I was in England literally in January for my enrollment and my induction week at the school to get all my books and everything. And then as soon as I got back, like COVID hit a few weeks later. Isn't that crazy? It was insane. When I was in London, I was like regretting like, oh my God, I should have just came to school here. I should have just been physical here and been at Bloomsbury campus and blah, blah, blah. And then COVID hit. So I'm really, it's just the timing was impeccable. Okay, so did you do the New York bar? No, I do not advise the New York bar unless you have completed your LOB in the last two years. They're really freaking anal and they'll get um, they'll take about a year to get back to you once you've applied and they have their own internal evaluation people and they're American I don't trust this system because they wasted basically a year of my time and then in the end they told me I had to do the American masters because I didn't complete my LOB within the last two years of applying to them they're very weird with time um so yeah, that's how it is there. Also, they said that my credentials weren't accepted, which is stupid because I come from an accredited university, which I liked the California bar. So they each have their own rules. I spoke to the head of the international admissions at the New York, uh, at the New York bar, and they didn't know, they didn't seem like they knew what they're talking about. The good thing about California Bar is they make you go to a professional credential evaluation service. A to Z evaluations is amazing. I got my credentials evaluated and yes, I pass. I am I have a certificate that says my credentials are what are the equivalent of an American JD. I knew that. At the New York Bar, I don't know why they have these Americans evaluating European credentials. It doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, Anyway, I think hiring an external evaluator is more equitable. It makes sense. It's logical. Um, so New York's doing their own thing. And apparently majority of foreign, even foreign lawyers who are qualified in their own country still can't sit the bar in New York. A lot of them still have to do the American Masters. New York is very difficult to get into and I don't recommend it unless you fit all their elitist criteria. California is much more open. So you have to pay around three, 350 to get the full, full credential evaluation from A to Z. The head guy, the owner, he is a German or well, Austrian. He's from Europe, but he knows European degrees, especially English degrees. So they will have everything done for you. Once California accepts that, you still have to do an American master's unless you did some sort of joint degree that you did some sort of American credits. This is what I don't like about the whole American bar thing. On their website, I would say it's slightly misleading. It looks like you can sit. They're like, oh yes, as long as you get your uh, credentials evaluated and it's equivalent of a JD, you can sit the exam, but it's not like that. California, even though they accepted all my credentials and everything, they still required me to do the American Masters. So when I called them, I was like, what the hell? This is what he said. They didn't make any sense. They were kind of going in a loophole and I feel, I don't want to say this, but it seems like they're just taking people's money. Because why have students jump through hoops when in the end you require them to do an American Masters after the credentials are evaluated? What is the point of having your credentials evaluated if they still have to do the Masters? Anyway, the lady over the phone was like, you can either do the American Masters. Mind you, the American Masters is $68,000 to $70,000 for nine months. Or you can qualify in your jurisdiction in the UK with an LPC or the bar and then sit the exam. So I look into the LPC because I just don't have, I didn't have, I didn't have the patience to sit, to do the UK bar again. And I had to look back and ask myself whether that was the best choice for me. So I'm going to go through this with you and why I chose the LPC over the bar this time. Anyway. The LPC and the bar is significantly cheaper. The LPC and the bar can range between 13,000 to 16,000, 17,000 pounds. That is so much cheaper than the American Masters, which cost you around $70,000. So I thought, hell, of course, I'm just gonna go back to my own jurisdiction and, and 
qualify there. So that's why I'm doing the RPC. So why didn't I choose to do the bar all over again? The bar is very difficult. I've told you this before. People who, all these pompous assholes indoor who say, oh, the bar is so easy. Da da da, you're a fucking idiot if you complain about it. They need to get off the fucking high horses because honestly, it's not easy. Not easy at all. My little girl. Hold on, I just woke her up. Okay, I I'm still a mummy. Even though I don't have a human child, I still have a child. <laughs> okay, my little pug child. All right. So it's extremely stressful and you really do need all your focus. But I sat back and I thought, what do I want to do? What's my absolute dream job? What is it? What's my dream job? And I thought, you know, being a barrister, you get caught up in this whole prestige. So people who don't know the difference, okay, so solicitors, they're like, they're like more comparable to general attorneys, but they only have rights and rights of audience in some courts. Basically, a right to litigate, um, but it's not the same. Like barristers, they they have rights of audience in all courts, and all they do is litigation. But solicitors are the ones that hire barristers. But barristers have all this prestige and history attached to their legacy and the name it's the bar you know what i mean so you know you belong to one of the inns of court i was part of middle temple failing the bar is the absolute worst thing your inn gets notified and when you get notified that you failed they're like we've notified middle temple that you were not successful it's like shame 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 on you we have told everyone we've told your inn of court shame on you you failure I am winning in the failure realm. Yes, so that's what it was like. <laughs> My world was absolutely bloody crushed. I was so depressed. I spiraled downhill when I failed, when I found out. And it just pissed me off even more because my when I applied for like mitigating circumstances because of the shit I was going through they didn't accept it yet a whole bunch of students I knew that got fake sick notes had the mitigating circumstances accepted so they had more time and another chance to do their exams which I wasn't granted so much you know for being honest but hey so I sat back and I'm like thinking what do I want to do? What's my absolute dream job? My absolute dream job is to be an international corporate lawyer that works for a big company, whether it's a fashion house or like Google or some large company. I love international law. I want, and big companies are multinationals. So I want to be dealing with cross-border disputes. I want to do advisory work. I want to do all kinds of stuff. I want to be that multifaceted lawyer i don't need to be a barrister myself through all that unnecessary stress to become a barrister when i don't really need to be a barrister for what i want to do also when you're on the bar all they do is tell you that litigation is the last resort it is not what we're aiming for and you're thinking the whole bloody time why the fuck am i here you get so pro-litigation and pro-advocacy, you white knight in shining armor, put forward your case, defend with, like fearlessly, honor and all your integrity and you put your gift of gab to use and your skills of diplomacy and, and persuasion. Just being a barrister and able to put forward a case and fight your case. But then when you get to the bar, all they tell you is we're moving forward to mediation. Everything needs to be pushed to mediation. Re litigation is the last, last, last resort. You do not want to litigate. It's too costly and it's, it's too stressful and it's time consuming and it causes tension and it's adversarial and it causes all kinds of animosity. Like between the parties, it could cause parties to burn the bridges. And a lot of the time, that's not the best solution. It breaks down relationships, especially when two companies are trying to work things out. It's very 
combative and bitterness and resentment between the parties. It's just, it's not a positive thing. Sometimes you do need to litigate, but the point is you have this glorified idea of litigation when you're in school, you know, thinking you're the white knight going into the court and you're going to save the day. But in reality, it is such a stressful, time consuming, expensive process. And it's not what it's cracked up to be, what you think it is. And the CPR, you know, the new civil procedure rules, especially that we have so much European law from European, you know, influences from European law, we have moved away from litigation being the first resort. It is the last resort. And it's all about mediation, arbitration. It's all, it's all about ADR, alternative dispute res resolution. We're trying to be like America. We want to be the least, you know, adversarial as we can be. We want to maintain relationships. We want to spend as little money as possible, make it as efficient and cost effective as possible and as quickly as possible. So that's why people are moving towards ADR. The bar, yes, it has this history, this legacy, this thing to be proud of because that is what the English jurisdiction is made up of and a lot of culture and traditions behind being part of a law society and the whole thing. But then you gotta step back and I think if I were a barrister, I'm gonna struggle. You're going to struggle for the first five years unless you have contacts or you were just so amazing that you got into this high flying high. city chambers and, and you're getting all these amazing, expensive, high profile cases. But for the vast majority, it's not like that. You are scraping for the first five years at least. Sometimes it can take you at least 10, 15, 20 years to even start making six figures. It's not as glamorous as it seems. And if you're willing to make all those sacrifices and the unknowns, then by all means go do what you need to do. But also notice and recognize that the numbers, just the statistics, the employment rates, the success rates of barristers are a lot lower, it's like under 50%. Solicitors have like in the 90 something percentile of employment rate when they're, when they're finished uni. So there is a higher success rate going the solicitor route because there are a lot more law firms and companies that just need a solicitor. Not everyone wants to, you know, not everyone's looking to go to court now. Not everyone wants to fight the case and, and have this, battle of litigation it's not the most productive resolution so take a step back and separate all the notions that were put into your head during school and ask yourself you know is it all about the wig and gown and the legacy and the history of the prestige or do you want to get paid and live a life you know the life that you want to live you're going to make more money starting out as a solicitor and of course potentially more money as you go on. If you're going to practice in America or be dual qualified, you don't need to be a barrister for that. In America, they don't give a fuck whether you did the bar or the LPC. It look, they look at it as the same thing. So why do the more stressful one? Do you know what I mean? The LPC, I'm not gonna say it's easy. It's just more work, but the I feel like the bar was a lot more difficult because of the structure of the course and the actual material. The LPC I find easier, but there's a lot more paperwork, a lot more pressure to have these submissions in every nine days. Um, I mean, I am stressed, but the actual work, like the concepts are easier. And everyone I know that's done both bar and the LPC will back me up on that, but the LPC is easier. So if they are the same thing in America, why am I doing the bar? Especially when being a barrister is not my end goal anymore. I wish that I came to this realization earlier and did the LPC immediately after I failed the bar. But I was so on my high horse where I was like, ooh, 
don't want to be a solicitor. I never did. I would die than, than, I'd rather die than do the RBC. Like it was that bad. In the bar, there's such a sense of elitism because of the whole legacy and history with the bar. Solicitors are the ones that hire you and solicitors are the ones that feed you and pay your bills and put bread on the table because you need to be hired by them to work. So it doesn't make any sense in that sense. And the good thing about the RPC is you're learning so many things. So we also do advocacy because it's a skill that you need to have, but you're also doing a lot more in-depth stuff to prepare you to work in a law firm, to know how the machinery and dynamics and the workings of how a law firm operates. So you are doing a whole bunch of different tasks that would normally be asked of you as a solicitor. So it's not all going to be forms. I like, for example, in my commercial elective, I have to put together a slideshow for a company's employees for so they know about competition law awareness so they don't behave or act in a way that may breach article 101 of the tfeu things like that you have to know how to alter your words so that a lay person can understand legal concepts it's interesting because these are all really important essential and valuable skills that any company when you're going to interview are going to value these skills. And I think that's what's beautiful about doing the LPC is that you are prepared and you are training to know what the hell you're doing once you enter a law firm. And if you know that, then you can work anywhere. If you know how to, how, the, how a law firm operates and all the things that are going to be expected of you to do, and you have all these skill sets because this is what we've been training to do all year, in America, they do not have the equivalent of the LPC or the bar course. They just do exams and then they're like thrown right into it. So I think companies over here are going to value UK graduates because we are trained how to be a lawyer. Okay, That's so next question. What are the entry requirements and fees of the course? Okay, so I already told you about the entry requirements. You are required to do an American LLM with California unless you did California law courses because they have their own specific law. I told you about New York, very hard to get into. I don't even recommend it because they were so incompetent um, with admin stuff. I have such a bad taste in my mouth. But at New least York. Cali Bar, you know what to do. You either get qualified in your jurisdiction. So with your LBC or the bar, you can sit the California bar exam. You just have to get your credentials evaluated by A to Z evaluation services and I will link the service below and they are one of the officially recommended listed evaluators on the California bar site they do not accept any other evaluators so don't try and go elsewhere because it's cheaper they have a specific list of evaluators that are accredited and that are accepted officially accepted by the California bar like I said the LLM is like around seventy thousand dollars full exam fees though it's around 700 I think it's 799 dollars to take the exam and that's like a hundred dollar processing fee for the application and that's 350 dollars for your full credential evaluation so it's actually not that expensive considering you know with law students we're used to paying so much more so that that's actually nothing compared to you know the prices we pay for our courses and like that. I'm going to go through other questions that I came across. Piyush Patil says hey I have completed my Bull B five years in India and I'm planning to do my LLM in the UK so what is the BPTC and how is it different from the QLTS? Can you please help me out? Okay, Piyush, so basically the BPTC is very different from the, from the QLTS. Qualified Lawyers Transfer Scheme. Okay, so basically that's, a, that's an alternative route into becoming a solicitor. The BPTC is the official and only route to be a barrister in England. But the QLTS is for foreign lawyers or foreign educate, yeah, foreign lawyers to become an English solicitor. So you do assessments that basically kind of pull you through to the end goal of being a, a qualified solicitor in the UK. So the assessments are regulated by the SRA. 
solicited route, no experience requirement or training at all to complete. So you do the MCT, which is a multiple choice test, very similar to the MBE, which is the multi-state bar exam in the USA, consists of 180 questions with five possible answers, several practice areas in English law. Okay, so yeah, the QLTS is not like um, the regular academic program that you go through to qualify. It's an alternative method for foreign lawyers to get qualified as a solicitor. So you can't really compare the two because VPTC is the academic route to be a barrister, litigation, wig and gown, courtroom. QLTS is to be a solicitor with assessments, but you have to figure out whether you're going to be qualified to do the assessments by reaching out to the SRA and because I don't know about qualifications in India and how the legal qualifications um, translate into... So that is something that you have to email the school about or the SRA. You can email the school too and ask them. They may forward you to the SRA. But that's something that has to be worked out with your country's qualifications and the UK's program, the QLTS program. But yeah, potentially you can go through this training program, do the assessments and become a solicitor in the UK. So that's the difference between the two. The bar is the long, year long course to become a barrister. Two very different things. So that's something okay. you have to think about. I know there are, if you get into top commercial sets, you can start off nearly six figures as a barrister, but you have to keep in mind that percentage of people who get that, it's so small, so, so small. You have to be extremely brilliant and shine far brighter than the rest of your colleagues to get into that thing. The rest of everyone will be struggling. You're not gonna get paid that. Barristers, there's some barristers who are starting out, you know, especially with the first, first um, six, you know, when you first start out in chambers are barely making like 30 grand a year, something like that, it's just very low. So solicitors, you have more income stability, you have uh, job stability because you're on a salary. Whether you work for a company or a law firm, you're going to be more financially stable as a solicitor. Okay, so Red One All Islam, I have just done my LB finals in University of Bristol. Please let me know which one is easier comparatively. LBC or BBC? <laughs> I already answered this. LBC is easier. <laughs> okay, Malik Abdulaziz asks, is pupillage compulsory for international students who want to practice law in their home country? That depends on your home country, right? Because every home country has their own requirements of what you need to practice. So pupillage is necessary if you want to be a barrister in the UK. But it's not required if I want to practice as an attorney in the US. As far as I know, it's only necessary if you want to practice in the UK, unless your country specifically also requires pupillage. But in America, no, that's not necessary as we don't have barristers, attorneys, are big. we have general attorneys and they do everything. From Haider Shahid, so I did a law degree for two years from the University of Buckingham or did an LLB from Hertfordshire, would I, if I, sorry, it's the way it's written, or did an LLB from Hertfordshire, would I be shunned for pupillage or to become a trainee solicitor due to mid-range universities like isn't law in general competitive like city law firms also why do why do you solicitors in general incompetent such the ones at court and if it sorry this is a lot of typos a lawyer is not taking your side and is on the other side even when representing you are the, they deemed clueless my uh, university university of wolverhampton that i did my LOB in is known to have pumped out some great lawyers and barristers and some legends within the legal world. Chris Tanner was one of my lecturers and I have so many people in London, all these posh boys that I did the bar with, um, tell me, oh my God, Chris Tanner was your lecturer and he wrote a ton of books and he's so respected, graduate of University of Wolverhampton. And I know a couple of great barristers who are very respected in the legal world and they got the break by playing golf. 
Like it really doesn't matter. Like if you are shining, it doesn't matter where you're from because someone's going to notice you. If you have that passion, just keep doing it. You know, it really doesn't matter. I've seen people from top universities with top grades not get hired because of the personality. So you have to fit in with the firm. So don't get all down in the dumps because you're not of Oxbridge. So last question is a question I get all the time. If I've missed any, I will go back and do another video. I'm really tired right now though after all this. So answer a general question that I do remember that I get a lot of. How my how is the LPC going? My experience so far with the University of Law. <laughs> okay, I'm laughing because a lot of my colleagues, we have like this um, co communal group chat between all of us that are on the distance learning LPC LLM program. Um, many, many students are not satisfied because of, you know, it's, it is COVID. You know, so a lot of the schools were not well equipped to handle this, even though our course is online already the pandemic obviously will still have an effect on us because we were supposed to be in London like two to three times this year for face-to-face -face things in our course it's not completely distance you have to show up back in the UK for certain things but since Covid they moved everything online I'm just really happy that we were granted concessions meaning any exam that we didn't do in August or any exam that we failed in August, we get another chance at a first sit, meaning it's not going to be capped. It's going to be graded as the first time you're sitting. So you get a full chance getting full marks. So I postponed majority of my exams to March because I just could not focus in August. And I did two exams in August and I, I passed them both. Yay! I did, I did advocacy and practical legal research. My course at the University of Law, I'm quite happy with it. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues are not, but I come from experience of the bar at City University of London. Um, their materials are not at all very easy to digest. I I came across some old materials the other day and I looked through the book, I'm like, holy hell, how does one get through a paragraph without their eyes glazing over and falling asleep? Not digestible, tiny little font. Oh my God, it, no wonder why I struggled even more. With all the technical issues that we've experienced with the University of Law, you know, people are complaining about this and that, but I feel, Coming from the bar course at City, we were thrown into the deep end. City does not spoon feed you and the materials they give you are quite difficult to comprehend. It's, it's all clustered and the way they write it, just the way they structure everything, it's not easy to look at, it's not easy to read, it's, it's like that. University of Law has actually been a fresh breath of air for me. A breath of fresh air for me. It's late, I'm sorry. And I can't say anything because they're all complaining like on the chat. But here I am like, it's not that bad. It's not that bad because my experience on the bar with City was way more stressful and difficult. The only thing I find stressful about the University of Law is the submissions. They're on our ass all the time to to submit the, these homework assignments. But these ho homework assignments, I'm kind of belittling it a bit. They're not just homework assignments. Like, we need to know this shit. <laughs> They're like mandatory blocks of info that we have to know every single thing of what we're learning right now as everything that we're submitting are things that we are going to have to do on the, on the exam. But I feel a lot more pressure to submit these assignments than I felt on the bar. Because the bar you had to just, like we had workshops and things that we did in class, but it wasn't like, you didn't really feel that much pressure. If you didn't do it, you didn't do it, you know? Like, 
it wasn't like it wasn't like, oh my God, shame on you. Like, if you don't, you don't submit your submissions on the RBC, your lecturers will literally email you like, hi, Tina, I noticed that you didn't submit for the last two units. Is everything okay? If you need more time, if you need an extension, please do let me know in advance. But they are on your ass. And in a way, it's good because I, I work best under pressure and I really hate being emailed by then. I have missed a bunch but I was able to catch up on my own time as long as you understand the work. So what I will say about University of Law is that their material is so easily digestible. I love it. I fucking love it. I love the way they lay everything out. They repeat a lot, but in a good way. They have, so every unit, right? We have units for every subject. And there's two like terms, if you wanna call it. So in the first half of the year, we had like the core modules. And in the second half, we have our electives and then the dissertation. So electives you get to choose. So I chose my favorite three, which is international commercial law, international intellectual property, and international competition and antitrust law. I love them all. I'm just enjoying it so much. I'm having a ball this time around. Hated first time because I was doing things I didn't want to do. I noticed that the ones that I was submitting were things that I was naturally drawn to. So I was submitting a lot of IP and commercial business, but forgetting all about like, forgetting about like property and like, um, so I can't even taxation. I bloody abhor maths. I hate it. Like, hate it. I, I just can't stand numbers. Most lawyers um, can't. But yeah, accounting and things like that. Like we, there's some accounting stuff and wills and stuff that we have to do in the second term, but majority of the second term is the stuff we chose. So that's okay. We, there's still some accounting stuff and I'm still trying to understand that. It's just horrible. Solicitors counts and things like that. Um, I think that's the shitty thing about the LPC that the bar doesn't have. On the bar, you don't have to do taxation and accounts and things like that. Yeah. But overall, the LPC is easier. It's just, I feel like the workload is, you have to do more work, but the concepts are easier to understand, if that makes any sense, except for the, for me, except for the taxation, because I hate numbers. But Everything else easier to digest and understand because the materials on the LPC are amazing. They're so easy to read, the way they lay things out. Often they, so they bullet point things and then they summarize things and then they'll explain the same thing over again. I noticed that once I get through, like, so for every unit, right? We have like, you'll have like different units for different modules and you know, go through unit one. So you'll have to hand in, um, you know, criminal. Yeah, criminal is another thing that I really don't like. Civil is another thing that I don't like. Okay, so criminal and civil litigation, taxation, every, they all have units. So unit one for all of those things you'd have to hand in. So they're basically assignments. Things, you know, you have to read a bunch of chapters, you have to read different cases, and then you're going to have these like problem questions, or you're going to have forms that you have to fill out. Um, things that you would normally be asked of if you were working in a law firm so you're always going to get like an email from your supervisor that's always the scenario so in the beginning you're like a trainee solicitor and then like as you go through the course you are like a new solicitor an actual solicitor so they kind of treat you as you are as you are progressing through the course they kind of treat you as they would if you were working in a real law firm which is cool so you're getting these like fake emails scenarios asking you to do certain things. Oh, I have no time. I had to go to lunch. I'm out of the office. Can you do this for me? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> um, and then you get to do other things. Like as a solicitor, you may not realize, but sometimes, you know, your client is a big company and they want you to do some employee training programs for compliance training. Like in my commercial law course, I've had to do two slideshows so far to just teach lay people who are commercially aware but not legally aware and put it into simple layman's terms so they understand they don't break the law basically <laughs> so 
so the company doesn't come under fire and breach of contract or whatever and that's quite fun as well so i am quite enjoying the lpc even though it's a lot more like of a workload the actual work itself isn't as difficult to understand because of the way university of law has set out their material i'm really impressed with these books they're all the same they come from all the same um set of books i mean different authors and stuff but as you can see they're all from like the same line the clp legal practice guides but they're all really easy to understand they're all really well written they talk to you like as a person they even have some humor in there like it's it's quite cool they're really easy to read and they just speak to you. It's not just a bunch of legal jargon. Like this is the kind of thing that you have to do on the bar. You just carry around like civil procedure book and it's just like, oh my God. I mean, you don't have to use those anyways. Like, but the thing is, it's just like the materials on the bar are just a lot more drier, just full of jargon. It's, it's criminal practice Bible book. And then you'd have to like, you know, these kind of books, you know, oh my God, just so difficult to get through. Amazing. Like, like these, the manuals, they're just, they're so easy to understand and it's just a pleasure to read. Your students um, saying they're a pleasure to read. That's a big statement, you guys know. <laughs> so, yes, competition, law book. So, yeah, University of Law is amazing. So, I... My, I was having like technical difficulties ordering my books because there was something wrong with the site. So I like emailed them and they literally sent my books the next day. Overnight, like to America from the UK. Like it's pretty impressive. And then I didn't have a, an excuse not to do my work. Get these books out to her. So yeah. Anyway, so my exams have been postponed to um, March. The ones that I was supposed to do last August. And then I've got exams coming up in like December, January. So I'm going to really put my head down now and get to it. But so far, personally, I've really been enjoying the course at University of Law just because the material is so well set out, so well written. It's not overwhelming. The way they lay out the information and everything is really... Um, What's the word? All I can say is digestible. Everything is just so digestible. You won't get overwhelmed just as long as you don't keep post postponing things and procrastinating things that I did. But when you actually look at the work and look at the questions and stuff, it's not so bad. You just have to do it. So anyway, any other questions, please do leave your comment below and I will gladly do another video for you. I hope I've answered some of your questions in this video. Do not give up. You know, I, I failed the bar in 2015 and it took me like literally another five years to just get back on it because I was so caught up with the whole mindset, like if I can't be a barrister, I can't be anything. The bar, nothing. It's very melodramatic and, and just stupid and, and what a prat I was, seriously, just so overly yeah it took me a while to get out of that mindset and step out of my comfort zone and think what do I really want to do now I'm so happy doing the RPC that I'll be qualified to be a solicitor in England and it will also allow me to sit the bar in California so that's that um I am wishing you all a very lovely weekend Muchos besitos, cool bisous, and take care. Bye-bye.